So let's start. Uh, let's go to the step-by-step -step guide for CPIC to the slide uh, number two. <clears throat> so let's try to understand a bit uh, the complexity of the CPIC project. So as we said, CPIC is a particle in cell method. You can clone it from the repository and official of the, of the project. And it is, compo it is written in the C programming language. It is composed of 14 files and provides different uh, binaries or different solutions to different electromagnetic problems. In particular, we have focused on one code that is the EM2D uh, example. That is a finite different code. And essentially it consists of 14 files, almost 200 functions, so considerably large code, almost 150 loops, and more than 4,000 lines of code. So starting from zero to try to understand how to port this code to GPU can be very, very challenging, okay? So please, slide number three. Okay, the first thing we need to do is uh, to establish the baseline. So let's, uh, we can, uh, enter in the directory of the em to the application, typical make clean, make and run of the application. When you run the application, you will be see that it starts a simulation. It's a typical simulation with simulation steps that at each step performs an update of the solution using this particle in cells method. At the end of the simulation, it reports the time taken to to the simulation, which is what is highlighted here. In particular, this is uh, uh, running for above 10 seconds, okay? And then it also provides some figures of merit that can be relevant for the for the code, but we will, we will not be focusing on, on that uh, at this step. Also on the upper side of the slide, you can see that these kind of applications, you can use different use cases. In particular, we are using what they call the Wavell use case over a grid of 128 by 128 cells running over 500 time steps, okay? With each particles per cell. This is something specific of particle in cell methods. You will see that we will not go into the details of the numerical method or the computational method. We will try to do it as a computational scientist that takes the code that is new and tries to apply best practices for performance optimization. Okay, so um, slide four, please. As usual, let's start with a profiling of the application. Remember that CODI is not a profiler. So in big applications, you need to start with a profiling because that way you will be able to run the screening for the whole application and probably quickly is to the screening of only the portion of the code that is consuming most of the runtime. In the example code we saw yesterday, there were complete applications, but small where the hotspot was only one single function or one single loop typically. In CPIC, the thing is a bit more complicated. What we do here is with the GProf um, profiler, we do what GProf calls a flat profile. The profiler inspects, uh, instruments the code, executes a binary that records for every single function call. It counts the number of function calls and also calculates the accumulated execution time for each of the functions. So here you can see a spec advance with 1000 calls taking 50% of the time over seven seconds. You can also see interpolate FLD with uh, 130 million calls taking 22% of the execution time. And also depth current thumb with similar 130 million executions or calls taking 19% of the time. So essentially we can think that spec advance is the way to start. If we also look at the GProf call graph, we can also see that spec advance in reality amounts for 99% of the time. Why? Because the code is complex enough and the Spec advance, that is the main simulation loop, also calls the interpolate FLD and the dev current thumb uh, function calls. So somehow the three functions altogether represent the hotspot. 
So let's move to the next slide, please. And this is what we try to conclude here. It's not one single function with one single loop that is clearly the hotspot. We will need to manage the complexity of real codes where the hotspot somehow is a call graph. So a set of functions related together that we need to see how to port to the GPU. Porting function calls is problematic. Porting real calls operating with uh, complex structures that are passed through the function calls is also problematic, especially on the CPU side, but also especially when you port to the GPU. And that is the reason probably why, why when you look at the code of experts in the GPU, you typically see functions that are somehow self-contained, not trying to avoid function calls, and that somehow operate on, let's call it plain arrays. So typically arrays of basic data types, okay? This is, let's say, what you see in libraries, highly optimized. It doesn't mean that you cannot port to the GPU code with structs or code with pointers to structs. Is that just do the mapping, the data transfers back and forth from the CPU to the GPU is way more complicated, more time consuming and more error pro. So essentially, this is our starting point. Spec advance jointly with these two functions represents more than 90% of the time. So definitely the way to the point to start uh, working with. Okay, slide six, please. Okay, in this slide, we are trying to summarize the path that we will follow. To go from this complicated real code serial version to a version that uh, has isolated the hotspot loops in separate, in loops that can be analyzable and that somehow um, don't have the complexity of the original code about function calls, pointers to structs, structs of arrays, and all these kind of things. So the route, the path that we are going to do, guided by Kodi, is let's start with the serial version. After that, in the step one, what we are going to do is isolate the part of the code with the data that operates on. Typically, uh, this is going to be done with outlining. This means that the target loop is going to be separated into a separate function. And we want to have arrays or structs that with the data that is processed in its iteration of the outlined computation. What this means is that Typically, we have large domains in this kind of simulation applications, and at each step, the, the computation only process a subregion of the whole simulation domain. So, could we see in vectorization, we see in GPUs, applying a technique called gather scatter enables to gather the data spread in memory to consecutive arrays that can be processed locally on the CPU and the GPU. This enables efficient processing and efficient memory accesses, and the results need to be scattered to the original to the original position. We will see that in step number one. In step number two, we will see that there are some functions that are easily managed by compilers or easily managed by tools like OD, but there are others that can be very problematic. And a, a good example is this function dev current thumb. So we will see how inlining this function enable suddenly uh, a lot of checkers to be detected uh, by Kodi. The next the step three is going to try to do something very typical, try to remove arrays of structs that typically lead to inefficient memory access, complicated syntax in the computation loops, and try to move to separate arrays. So pointers in this case to uh, basic data types like double or, or float. The step number four, what we were, we are trying to do here is to illustrate whenever you have complicated applications with complex loops, typically there is a part that can run efficiently in the GPU and there is another part that cannot run efficiently in the GPU. So loop fission is typically a technique where the loop body is split to separate the part that is amenable to the GPU from the part that is not amenable to the GPU, okay? This, Loop fission is also used extensively in vectorization, in multithreading, in many areas of performance optimization. We go into the details from step zero to four, interleaving the explanation with real executions of uh, Kodi 
uh, commands. So at the end of step four, we will have a version where we can use Kodi PW directives to produce optimized code for using multi-threading with Atomic, the simplest uh, strategy that Kodi supports, and two versions for GPU that use the Atomic uh, protection to use OpenMP and OpenECC. All the process in the zip file that uh, we have shared with you, Ulysses, if you can share your terminal and show uh, the contents of the zip file. Exactly, entering the CPIC project and list the contents. Okay, what you see here is that we provide you with a, <clears throat> a script to launch on Perlmutter the CPIC application. And we also provide you with all the versions of the code after each of the transformations. And the launch script is prepared so that it goes into one version, compiles, runs, and benchmarks that version. Once it finished, goes to the second version and repeats the process. So the launch script is quite uh, long and produces a huge output. That is the result of executing these uh, seven versions of CPIC, CPIC code, each of which with the changes uh, described in the step-by-step -step guide. Okay, so this is what you have here. And for the sake of time, what we will be doing is, we will be present describing each step at the end of the step, Ulysses will be running the commands that you have in the step-by-step -step guide. And we will be doing this for each of these steps. Okay. So uh, let's go then to the slide number six. Okay. And let's start with the serial version. Okay. The first thing we are going to do is what we recommend. Let's, with, with Kodi, let's do an assessment to see how many checkers Kodi can find in the original version of the code. And as we will see here, Kodi reports zero checkers related to offloading. So this is a problem we need to solve. If you go to slide number eight, the next step as we explained yesterday of the workflow of Kodi is let's start with the screening. Then let's produce the checkers report to understand what, is, what it has found. And we can see that Kodi has found one memory issue that can be relevant. The only problem is that this PWR35 that reports non-consecutive memory accesses is related to the loop at line 798, which is not the hotspot loop within the spec advance uh, function. The hotspot loop is at line uh, 657. Uh, uh, so this means that the checkers reported by Kodi are not useful at this stage. Okay, uh, 677 is the original loop, that one. Perfect. This is our target loop. So slide number nine. And this is new. We didn't see this yesterday. So what happens? What can we do when Kodi reports zero checkers for GPU? What the only one that reports is not relevant because it points to a loop that is clearly not a hot spot. So what we can, what we can do is ask Kodi to provide us with information about parts of the code that could not analyze successfully. We do this by invoking PW report with the option dash dash non-analyzable. And with this, what we get is a rank of all the features found in the code that Kodi, for some reason, could not process uh, completely. And here we can see that it points to the usage of fields of extracts clearly a problem in this kind of real applications. Pointed aliasing in function calls, also another problem dealing with calls to functions. And also the number three, unstructured code. Okay, clearly three things that can be a pain to optimize performance. So we, if we want to relate this non-analyzable or unsupported features somehow by Kodi to particular loops, we invoke PW loops. This is a new tool. Remember, we yesterday used PW report to get the insights about the code, PW directives to rewrite the code. PW loops is a way to get more insights about information reported by PW report, but the information is located in the loops found in the code. So somehow 
it scopes the information or the checkers in the loops that are present in the code. So this is a good way of uh, continue diagnosing what's going on in the code. And here where we can see that it reports the loop 677, which is our target, and reports that there is a potential aliasing for a particular function call. And if you remember, interpolate FLD is one of the functions called inside spec advance, which is the, that is the one. Okay, so managing the function call with the pa parameter passing through pointers, aliasing between the actual arguments and the parameters of the function, this is always problematic for compilers and for any uh, analysis loop and even for humans, for experts to track what data is actually being processed inside the function. Okay, so going back to the slides. That's it, let's see. Um, the command execution of these three things in the in the console. Is it serial? So you just copy and paste what we left ready for you in the step-by-step -step PDF. And here we have the, you should see the same results. So here's the output of the PW report, non-analyzable. And here's the output of the PW loops, non-analyzable. So the first one, as Manuel said, summarizes the um, non-analyzable uh, issues and PDR loops uh, reported them in the scope of loops. So we actually can pinpoint these uh, unsupported features with the actual uh, line of code in the source file. Excellent. So uh, what you can see here also is the result of um, where we develop Kodi core capabilities, like detecting the patterns, the opportunities to offload computations to GPU. At the same time, we collect a lot of information about the code. And one of our main challenges is to how to use all the information that we have hidden, not exposed to recommendations, to help users, to guide the users through this process for real applications. So we have come with this way of exposing the non we call them non-analyzable. It's not that it is non-analyzable, Kodi is analyzing this, but it's parts of the code that are particularly challenging for compilers, for Kodi, or for a particular code, okay? So this is the workflow that we will be using in the next of, in the rest of the steps. Screening, checks report, and non-analyzable, okay? So remember this additional step using the non-analyzable flag. If you have issues of you don't get the offloading or the multi-threading or virtualization opportunities or memory opportunities you are expecting. Okay, slide number 10. So, uh, what we're going to do is now in the step one is try to reduce the complexity of the code that the tool or the compiler needs to analyze. So we want to isolate the relevant part in a separate function that is somehow uh, that constrains all the code to analyze to that particular region of the code. So slide 11, please. We, what we are going using Outlining enables to do an incremental approach in the sense that if you try to touch the original code, I try to change uh, something related to the structure design or how the data structure is traversed. The problem is that you typically quickly modify a line in the loop. And you typically quickly have to propagate a lot of changes back and forth from the point of view that you have changed. So in order to avoid massive changes across all the code, one way to do it is outlining. Outlining is, let's focus on our target loop in this case, the loop at line 677, that has all of these issues in, func in lining, sorry, function calls, arrays of extracts, um, pointers, uh, and all of, these thi all of these challenges. And let's try to isolate the relevant part of the computation so that we can work starting from now only on that function, only on that loop. Okay, this is the purpose of the outlining technique. So in the slide 12, 
we can see an example very simple. In the example above, you can see a typical foo function that is using real data malloc with pointers, with structs, and it is processing all the elements of the array by using this, the accessing to a field of a struct that is an array. So in the end, you can understand the code because it's simple, but it's a challenge for any programmer. In real applications, it's a challenge for tools like compilers and code. With outlining, which is the code below, what you do is you create a new function, call it bar. And the function, you try to use arguments in the function that are simple types or simple data types. So in this case, it's a pointer to a double uh, basic data type in C. And then you code the same processing loop using just the, the regular array notation. And you, you replace the original loop with a function call. This way, instead of analyzing the whole main or full function, you can start focusing on processing only the new outline, the bar function. And you are limiting the analysis to a code, a region of the code. And if you do properly the parameter passing, you are simplifying the complexity of the code that needs to be understood by the developer and also by the tooling. Okay, so this is the purpose of the of the outlining technique. Slide 13. As usual, in real applications, it's not that simple. The spec advanced prototype function is very simple. There are three pointers to uh, structures, but the structures are really large. So when you do outlining, what you are doing is you are specifying as a specific parameters only the fields of those large structs that are really used in the in the in the in the loops. This way, if you have imagined a struct with 50 fields and you only use three, you are simplifying a lot the analysis and the comprehension of the application because inside the online function, you're only dealing with three fields out of 50, for instance. Okay. So this is time consuming to apply in real applications. These are usually uh, complex refactorizations, but in general, they bring benefit in general for performance optimization. So all of this work, we have done it in our lab. So we are going to provide you in the step one with a function already outlined. And we will call it a spec advance underscore outlining. Okay, slide 14. This is the code aspect of the application, but the code when it runs processes data. So the outline function is processing a subset of all the data set of the application. So applying outlining with gather scatter is many times convenient because in the end, what you are doing is um, in the original application, you have the data spread in large data structures. But when you focus only on three fields out of 50 of a struct, you're only accessing a portion of all that data structure. So it, it is good for performance to try to pack only the access data in arrays that can be processed in a sequential manner inside the outline function. If you achieve to do that, you have several benefits because in the end, you are making your outline function work only on the data in the subset of data that is relevant. And this data can be consecutive in memory with obvious benefits from the point of view of memory efficiency, data transfers, because the data, if it is consecutive in memory, is very good to exploit the cache, to exploit memory efficiency, and to make efficient data transfers. Okay, so gather scatter is essentially a technique used in pre in vectorization extensively, but we can use it in more complicated large of code. What is the basic idea? The basic idea is that I have a large data structure, let's call it Y, and I access randomly several data. What I do is I create a new loop, that is the, the gather loop, that picks up all the data and stores that data in a consecutive array. Now, the original loop operates on X. This is a loop that is not uh, depicted here for the sake of a space. When it finishes, Let's assume that it computes the, the output in X again. The result at the very end is in the consecutive temporary look data. So it needs to be scattered again, copied back to the original positions of the memory to keep the consistency of the global data structures of my real application. 
Okay, so again, the idea is simple. It's extensively using vectorization, for instance. So we are using similar techniques and I'm trying to apply them in a systematic manner guided by the features of the code. Slide 15. Okay, these are the three structures. You can see here in the code, large structures with nested structures, with arrays, with complex data types. So complicated stuff. So uh, in slide 16, what we have done here to implement gather scatter, we have created a new struct. We call it all data that has all the data with arrays inside that has all the data consecutive in memory. So whenever the gather takes the data from the original locations, copies it inside these buffers. Okay, of consecutive memory locations. Then the code will operate on these buffers. And at the very end, these buffers, the results will be scattered to the original, original locations. Slide 17. Okay, so touching the data structure or creating these auxiliary buffers, what means is that at the appropriate point in the, in the simulation of CPIC, you need to allocate the memory for these buffers. Before doing the computation on the GPU, you need to copy the original data into these buffers, and then you can offload or data, do the data transfer for these buffers. Now you leave the GPU computing, produces the results, and you copy back, transfer back the results to the buffers in the, in the memory of the CPU. And then you copy out, that means you take this data of these buffers and copy that into the original in the locations of the global data structure. This reminds me a lot of what we do typically in many MPI applications where you have the global data structure and you have internally implementations that map the global coordinates to the local coordinates of, the, of a given MPI rank. Somehow it's conceptually something similar. And at the end, you need to, to free the corresponding memory of the buffers. So again, as you see, touching data structures, outlining computations, uh, reducing the working set in terms of the data that is really needed for the code that's going to be offloaded may require significant refactorization of the code if the code has not been designed from scratch, from the beginning with performance in mind or with GPU in mind. So slide 18. Uh, I will go quickly over this, just let you know that CPIC has some additional complexity. We typically have two types of simulations, adaptive simulations and non-adaptive simulations. Somehow adaptive simulations are those ones that change the data that is uh, processed at each time step. So in this case, the, partic the particles or the particle in cell methods that are relevant for each time step change from one step time step to another. So somehow you also need to deal with the complexity of a uh, uh, packing and unpacking the data relevant for this adaptive application. So this is uh, a bit uh, more complicated. Let's touch it, only touch it uh, uh, with this description and let's move to slide number 19. So in the end, once you finish uh, this second step, what you have is the original application, the original spec advanced loop, but now instead of just having one loop, you have the calls to the to implement the gather, the scatter, the pack, and the unpack for the adaptive computations, and internally the outline function. If all of this is uh, implemented and debugged, in the end, in the spec advanced outlining function, you will have loops operating on consecutive data that is packed and unpacked in each step of the spec advanced field. So. This is something that if you design the application from scratch, you can take into consideration and maybe even avoid this overhead of pack and pack and outlining. But when you want to incrementally refactor an application to port it to GPU, to only port as a particular segment, we have found these uh, techniques commonly used uh, by experts, okay? So uh, we have this, uh, uh, refactorization in mind, 
without lining combined with gather scatter, slide 20. With CODI, we repeat the same process. Screening, which after the outlining still points out zero opportunities for a float. So again, we need to know why. Slide 21. So we jump directly into the non-analyzable and then here we see that CODI reports issues with function calls, which is also problematic for offloading and for compilers or for tooling in general. And it points to one particular function, dev current thumb, that is called inside the spec advanced function. Okay. Okay, so let's see these commands in action for step uh, one. We will have to move to the right uh, folder. So, so for the step one, the folder number one. And we can copy and paste the command again. And here we have uh, the zero results. So zero, zero checks report. But if you want to know what is happening behind the scenes, why? Uh, zero checks and for that we have the PDA report non-analyzable report and support interprocedural dependency analysis for a function and now if you want to see the the line of code where uh, this issue is detect we use PW loops And it's located in the particles.c line 772. So particles uh, 772, uh, uh, the version 1, 772. Here it is. Here is the issue. Here's the interprocedural dependency uh, analysis. Okay, one important thing to, no, to note, you were maybe wondering, okay, so CODI doesn't support interprocedural analysis. The answer is yes, CODI supports interprocedural analysis. So please open a tab in the browser, Ulysses. Yeah. Show in GitHub the performance demos uh, repository. Okay, if you want to play or do homework with additional scientific application that may be relevant for you. We also, we didn't mention this yesterday, but we have an additional resource that is a public repository called Performance Demos, where you have, for instance, image processing algorithms like Kani, you have Coulomb, you have HackMK from the DOE uh, benchmarks, you have conjugate gradient from the NAS parallel benchmarks. And some of the examples we are using here today are also in this repository. Open, for instance, HackMK, example. Uh, open the main file. Scroll down. Okay, the hot spot here is, uh, no, scroll down. Is that loop at line 132? Can you highlight it? 132. One, yeah. yeah. What you can see here, this loop at 132 is recognized as multi-threading opportunity by CODI. And you can insert and execute this on multi-cores, even if the code has calls to a procedure called step 10 ORIG. So this demonstrates that CODI is able to, to pinpoint opportunities, even in loops that have calls to functions. However, there is such a many different ways of coding parameter passing that our purpose, our intention is to, over time, support more and more ways of using or passing parameters in function calls. So some of them are already fully supported, others are not fully supported yet. So this demonstrates that CODI has interprocedural analysis. Going back to the example of uh, CPIC, this particular example has some parameter, that is not fully supported by CODI today. So it's our aim to understand what's going on and try to support it in future versions. 
Okay, so the answer is yes, we support interprocedural analysis, but this is so many different ways of coding it that we need to over time okay, support more and more, or sometimes it's easier for the developer to code in such a way that is supported by Cody. Okay, um, please go back to that one. Okay, so slide 22. Um, after, after this step, I think we can maybe uh, ask the audience if there are questions. So let me please finish step two, which is inlining. All of us are probably very familiar with this transformation. And inlining essentially trying to, uh, to give a solution to the issue reported by non-analyzable in CODI, that is the existence of a call to the current thumb with some parameter passing that CODI does not manage yet. So slide 23. What is outlining? Inlining, very easy. You have a loop with a function call. You go and replace the function call with the body of the function. And this gives you, after inlining in many situations, this gives you code that is more amenable to compilers and to optimization, like the one at the bottom, instead of the one in the middle that has a procedure call that is always a challenge because it introduces aliasing problems in, in the automatic analysis tools, okay? So conceptually, this is easy to understand. This is very well known. Let's see how we can how we apply this to CPIC. Slide 24. And here it is. In the line pointed out by Cody, the current thumb, we take the function body and we replace the function call with the function body, which you can see is a bit more, it's a big, quite a big function that needs to be in line here. Sometimes compiler also decide to inline functions automatically, but this is again, very dependent on the, on the compiler itself. What this is interesting is that the variables jx, jy, and jz essentially store the results of the computations of the hotspot loop. It's like 25. What we will see, again, the same workflow using Kodi, screening followed by checks. A screening after doing this suddenly goes from zero checkers to 120, 135 checkers and more than 100 related to memory. This is definitely something that is worth exploring, which are the memory patterns that are used in the loop. And if we need to... Uh, uh, do something else to have, for instance, sequential memory access patterns instead of non-consecutive memory access patterns, which will kill performance on the CPU and on the GPU side. Next one, Kodi, oh, sorry, PW reports dash dash checks. Okay, and here we see some interesting uh, recommendations related to row major indirect non-consecutive memory accesses, but we want to focus on the recommendation 36, because the, sorry, 16, because the, the, the recommendation 16 is pointing out one typical transformation that is used by experts in porting code or to increase the performance of the code. That is the recommendation that is, instead of using arrays of structs, which typically when you traverse or iterate over the elements of the array, you to make an efficient usage of the memory, replace this with structs of arrays or with plain arrays, separated arrays. It's two different ways of implementing it. So CODI, our aim is to, in these parts of the process, the non-analyzable features, what we want to do is to create recommendations and implement the checkers in the recommendations that can help that the pinpoint exactly what needs to be addressed. In this case is the typical recommendation. Try to avoid a race of structs. Okay, so slide 17. Okay, let's finish. Let's go to the console and execute the commands of slides 25, 26. And that can be a good point for Q and A, I guess. So again, we move to the folder of the version two. two. 
Copy and paste the screen invocation. Here we have the same results. And now if you want to see this uh, 135 checks, we use the checks report that we provide to you here. Here we have the complete list of the checks report. What Manuel was um, highlighting is this uh, recommendation 16. Uh, and here are the several recommendations 16 for each of the uses of this array of tracks. Maxim maximize the window for a moment. Oh. That's, that's better. So what you can see here is that Cody is identifying usages of array of structs inside the loop. Okay. So one of the things, usability improvements that we are also working on is if we are able to uh, put under the umbrella of one single recommendation 16, all the usages of PP fields of the struct for a particular loop, this is clearly more actionable that reporting a recommendation 16 for each of the in, the in different usages of the fields of this tract inside the loop. Okay, so this is the type of uh, usability issues that we are constantly improving to try to help and guide the users when pinpointing what is relevant and what is need, where they need to put the focus. Okay, okay, so. With this slide 27, we have completed the, the path, the journey through steps zero, one, and two. So I think it's a, maybe a good moment to maybe open the mic and reply any questions from the attendees, if any. I put in the chat where you can find more information and details as like recommendations, knowledge, like PWR link as 016 as shown in the output. So there's a big uh, catalog that you can check for. It was also mentioned in the uh, nurse welcome um, slides. Yeah. And also the GitHub, Sorry, Helen. the GitHub repo, but performance demos with more um, example codes. Ulysses, please show the knowledge base, the catalog in the in the tab. Sure. And also just uh, let's see the catalog, that one. The catalog, that one, perfect. Go to 16, recommendation 16. We are constantly improving the contents of these materials. So for each of these recommendations you get, if you scroll up, a concise description of the issue, the action to solve it, why is it relevant, okay? We try to keep the language and the descriptions simple so that an expert and someone new to the field can understand the relevance of why it is important. And always illustrated with code examples like this. Scroll down, okay? And finally, so before the recommendation and after the recommendation, how the code should look like, okay? And finally, we have additional contents. Scroll down, please. Okay, we have related resources. If you click on that, all the examples that we use in the catalog are also in a public repository that you can also clone, you can test the tool, the Kodi tool with these example codes. And again, this is intended to be very, the, the simplest examples we can find for all of the recommendations, all of the defense remarks of Kodi. So this is something that we also provide as a complement to the catalog. And also if you scroll down in the catalog to the very end, each of the recommendations also includes references to the glossary. So whenever you need something about a race of structs, it will point you to some of these contents that has some small description or literature 
about the topic. We try to keep it small so that over time we can also add external references to NERS website, uh, vendors websites, other websites that describe, give more detail about the issues. Okay. So remember, we provide you with the software, but more important, probably the open catalog with the performance demos to test the performance improvements you can get with Kodi uh, with realistic examples and the catalog all, all described and with very clear, simple examples to reproduce and to trigger the issue in Kodi. Okay. Um, okay, there is Koichi has raised his hand. Uh, yes, uh, so yeah, I have one question, but thank you very much for the presentation and then also those resources online. I really appreciate it and really uh, useful kind of training for me because I haven't had any formal training in optimizing code. One probably simple question is, could you repeat again uh, the motivation for outlining? I thought I understood when you are going through at that time, but going to inlining, I kind of forget. But the inline, I kind of easy to understand, still remember for, but outlining, I, I forgot. And I don't find that still on the website, it says it's still working on the, this particular article. Okay. So what, when would you use in lining is very clear. So you have a loop with a function call and the compiler or you or whatever struggle to understand what's going on in the through the function call. So the scenario where you, have, you have use in lining is very clear. Outlining is not so clear. So let's go back to the slide, uh, scroll up, uh, 12. Okay, so when, we propose to use outlining. Um, imagine that you have a loop with or without function calls. You don't care. A realistic loop with the complexity of deep data structures through pointers, arrays, and you have it clearly identified through profiling who is that your target loop. And then you start to say, okay, this target loop, what can I do with it? And you start to use, I don't know, Intel Inspector, Intel Vitunes, uh, NVIDIA tooling, and all of them pinpoint something about is memory issues, computation issues, something you can do about the code. But the question is, how do you enable your program to take advantage of that? And even go beyond that, okay? Because sometimes we see people using, for instance, Intel Vitunes because it gives you very deep information, but in the end, you go to a system where you don't have Intel tools. So somehow you collect more data, more information about your code in an external tool, but then you need to apply it to your, to your system without that tool. So what do you do? What you need to do is to, you need to somehow scope or reduce or bound the part of the code, isolate it so that you can analyze it and understand what to do, how to optimize it independently of the rest of the code. This is the main motivation for outlining in my personal opinion. Because if you try to analyze in the example code here on the right, what happens in the loop for at line 15, you need to quickly go up to the mallocs, to the data struct defi definition, to the pointers. So somehow in real applications, you, you may need to browse tens of files through complex classes, methods, and things like that. So you waste a lot of time tracking the origin or understanding the data structure or the problem. So outlining is a way of, in your code, making explicit the target snippet of the code that you want to target. And through the function calls, if you try to use as parameters the smallest possible variables or fields that are used inside your outline loop, then you're probably removing hundreds of fields in real applications of structs that are not relevant for that particular code snippet. So somehow you're helping the tools, you're helping yourself and your team to focus on the computation and the data and the codification of the, in the code of what is relevant for that particular hotspot uh, or part of the code. This is the main motivation for outlining. 
we don't we we have a candidate recommendation for outlining but we ha we had we implemented it one year ago but as the triggers for outlining we don't have them clearly defined almost every single loop with a pointer to extract triggered this recommendation so this was very confusing for the users so we disabled this recommendation until we learn more how to implement more precise triggers to identify scenarios where outlining can clearly be an advantage. Okay, so this is something that is work in progress in our team, but today we don't trigger a recommendation for outlining in Kodi for this reason. So, but that, that that doesn't mean that you cannot have it in your mind and try to use it for, for in your own benefit. Okay, great. Ah, yes, it does. Thank you very much. Okay. Great. Okay, any other questions? No questions yet on the Q&A doc. No hands raised, I guess. Okay, let's continue. Um, I have a question quickly. Um, sure. So what about the uh, calls to external libraries? Uh, you know, uh, math or, you know, science, other, mainly math libraries uh how do you how do you deal with them uh, you know this is of course particularly in the question of inlining not outlining per se but yeah yes the, in general the recommendation is that um, when you have calls to external libraries let's assume that you have only the declaration of the function you don't have the actual implementation okay you have the binary in a library installed in permuter as a binary you have the header file to use that library and link with that library, but the compiler, OD, yourself, you don't have the source code. So here in general, there is nothing you can do. The only thing you can do is uh, um, give a special treatment to standardized functions. For instance, libmath in the compilers, it always has a special treatment. Why? Because libmath standardizes a set of functions available in the, in the binary library, it standardizes the prototype, the declaration of the function, and it's always clearly defined what are the inputs, what are the outputs. So somehow the tools, the compilers and Kodi, make this a special treatment. So calls to function, libmath functions inside loops are perfectly managed by compilers, are perfectly managed by uh, Kodi. You can go beyond this and say, okay, why don't you give a special treatment to, I don't know, uh, Laplace or to BLAS, LAPAC, sorry, or to BLAS, as long as you or the community agrees that these are standard interfaces that don't change, the tool can find a call to a plus function and know exactly what are the arguments that are inputs, what is the argument that is an output, knows the data types, so it can model the, the behavior of these special functions in the loop bodies. And this is essentially what you are doing as a programmer. You are relying on a standardized interface that will not change. Otherwise, many codes can break. Make sense? Yes. Thanks. So in general, it's the same treatment as compilers do for libmath. Libmath is a good example. Any other questions? If not, let's continue with step three. Okay. So Go back, please, to slide 26. So for array of structs is such a relevant use case that we created a recommendation to try to pinpoint use cases where array of structs is relevant. We need to improve, as you saw, there is a lot of noise in the sense that for every single field of array of structs that is used, we trigger a recommendation 16. We need to figure out or to work to internally in our team to see how to group them all for, let's say, all the usages of the same struct 
and report them all together in one single recommendation system. But apart from these usability improvements that will come at some point, what is clear is that code is pinpointing a problem, a typical problem. So let's move to slide 28. That's it. So this is in the catalog. So this is a snapshot of the con contents of the catalog. So you can see the code before, so using an array of structs, clearly understood by the by a programmer. But if you look at it, it is only using two fields out of three fields of the struct. So this is typically has cache issues, locality issues, although the computations can be executed probably in multi-threaded mode. In the end, it executes inefficiently. It can lead to break or make more complicated the data transfers to the GPU. So the alternative here is, okay, let's replace in this particular snippet of code that I'm using, an array of structs by plain arrays, okay? In this case, the situation is different. Now you have a loop with regular arrays, regular array notation that can be handled perfectly by compilers and by tools like OD, or even by programmers. So slide 29. So before and after recommendation 16, here you can see that the code we have highlighted all the points, all the usages of the variable VP and in different fields across the body of the function. And you can see there are many of them. So today, each of these usages triggers one recommendation 39, so 16. But you can see, you can count that for BP, only the fields X0, X1, I0, I1, or DX, even if they're used multiple times, you can identify exactly the fields that are actually used from the whole definition of the data structure, okay? So what you need to do is to replace the data structure access to the field by a plain array. And of course, do the corresponding um, mapping or refactorization of the uh, data structure, which is not shown here, okay, in the slide. You have it everything in the code. Slide 30. Okay, after doing this replacement, again, regular workflow when using Kodi, screening, checks, and if needed, non-analyzable. So let's go directly into checks. And we can see now that recommendation 16 has disappeared. So all of the triggers for recommendation 16 were fixed. And now Kodi already has been pointing more, more, import, more uh, useful information. That is, okay, we are going to the final variables that store the results of the computation. That is this current JX, current JY, current JZ. And it is reported an indirect memory access. Indirect memory access is problematic. Locality cannot be predicted. If you go to multi-threaded mode, you need to make atomic protection at least to avoid race conditions. So recommendation 36 is clearly something that deserves your attention, okay? So let's go to slide 13. And let's use now let's try to understand um, what's going on. So PW loops, remember, give you the information reported by report, but scoped or linked to particular loops. If you invoke PW loops by default, that's the summary, it gives you a listing of all the loops and it shows you if Kodi was able to analyze the code, so code is analyzable, and it tells you if it was able to recognize Computation patterns. Computational patterns we saw yesterday, follow loops, scalar reduction loops, sparse reduction loops. There are more patterns, but these are the three essential patterns we studied yesterday. So what we can hear is that Kodi can find an sparse reduction in the inner loop at line 887. But our target, that is the loop 690, it reports the existence of a recurrence pattern. A recurrence is something you cannot paralyze or at least easily, and also reports NA. NA means that Kodi could not recognize the pattern. So something is going on here, and we will need to definitely separate the recurrence for the rest of the computation. Because recurrences, remember, are loops that has 
iterations between different dependency between different iterations. So you cannot split the iterations of the loop and execute different loop iterations concurrently without deep and appropriate synchronization. So in general, recurrence, you can simply say, okay, a recurrence in principle cannot be parallelized, at least easily, without significant synchronization. So what we need to understand is what is the origin of this NA? What is preventing CODE from finding a scalar reduction, a for all computation, or a sparse reduction? Slide 32. And for this, we used one advanced analysis that CODE reports. In order for CODE to report a sparse reduction, what it's doing behind the scenes is listing every single variable used inside the loop, read or written, tries to identify the temporaries. And for the remaining variables, tries to identify if the computations for that variable match one of the patterns. For all pattern, a scalar reduction pattern, a sparse reduction pattern, and recurrence pattern. What we see here is that our relevant variables and the PW loop stash dash the test scoping provides you access to the internals of CODE. It lists all the variables used in the loop. In this, in this case, our target loop at line 690. And it gives you data types, information, whether it is temporary or not, and the compute pattern that was detected by CODE. So here we can see the output variables, current, jx, jy, jz, are not recognized as a compute pattern. And also there are additional variables, spec, ix, iy, ux, uy, that are, cannot also be, be characterized. So clearly, this is something that is our job in the CODE team to remove these NAs and classify the patterns correctly. So what we can tell you is that when preparing the course, in the last minute, we found a hidden bug that was overseen during the preparation process. So here, DNA related to a spec variable, the fields should not be an A, should say temporary or recurrence. And with this information, the current variables will be classified as sparse reduction patterns, okay? So what we can tell you and promise is that this is being fixed. This is ongoing work. We could not do it in time until Monday evening. So, but, we will provide NERS with a version that fixes this issue. What we want to learn here is the process. Again, CODI screening, CODI checks, if something doesn't work, CODI non-analyzable. And if you need to uh, triage the information reported by PW report to specific loops, then you need to use PW loops. And PW loops give you a summary, data scoping, and also uh, non-analyzable flags to inspect every single variable and what's going on internally or behind the scenes, okay? So let's see these uh, commands in, in the command line. Sure. Folder of version three. And let's see the checks report. <clears throat> so here we have the same result. We have to look at the PWR 36 line 690. Uh, here it is. And now we run the um, PW loops. So we see what's happening at that loop regarding the compute patterns and the de dejection capabilities of Cody. Mm -hmm. I don't know why it's, it's low, but. So here we have the result <clears throat> for the loop that we wanted to see. Here we have the recurrence and NA that, as Manuel said, um, 
for these coming issues, identifying the compute patterns of some variables uh, of this loop. <clears throat> the next step is that data scoping. So we see which are these variables that are preventing Cody to identify the compute patterns of the loop. And this is the complete output of all of the variable usages of inside this loop. And um, for example, here we have uh, the variables that were are identified in the slice. As an A, Cody should detect them as temporal right or not. Okay, good. So let's try to move quicker through the next steps because I think it's more simple. So loop fission is clear what is the next step. If we have in the same loop, let, please move to slide 34, next slide. That's a very, very simple, simple example. If you have a part of the computation that cannot be vectorized, cannot be parallelized, combined with a part of the computation that can be vectorized, parallelized, or floated, you use loop fission to separate these two parts. So that at least you can optimize the performance of that particular that part of the computation. If that part is the more computation intensive and takes most of the time, you will still see significant improvements in performance. Okay? But this depends on each code and on the on each workload. But the technique is essentially as simple conceptually as that. So I, the slide, next slide. After, in this case, you need to separate the variables spec from the rest of the computation that compute the results, that is the sparse reduction. So you need to find a point in the loop body where you need to split the loop body, replicate the loop header, and make uh, the corresponding adjustments, typically small adjustments. Go to slide 36. After loop fission, now you can see that Cody uh, reports this indirect access, but all again, but also reports offloading and multi-threading opportunities. Okay. So if we come to this point, then the next is as we did yesterday. Now we have Cody pinpointing opportunities for offloading. So this enables using um, directives. So please go to next slide. So we complete the fission, next slide. And now we, from this point, this version, we can generate multiple versions using code writing capabilities. So slide 39. This is how the code will look like if we for, go to the CPU using multi, multiple threads and we this, decide to protect the sparse reduction updates with atomic protection. This is what you see in the line 947 this atomic update, okay? You have the complete code generated by Cody in the, in the deck. As we, as you will see, we were experiencing issues with uh, Permuter. Here we left as a reference, the, the values that we obtained with this transformation in Cody. So in Cody, with this, we obtained a, a speed up of 1.22x, okay? On the CPU side. Next slide. How about using OpenMP with atomic protection on the GPU? TPUs has improved very, very much in implementing very efficiently atomic protection. So here we saw with two different compilers on Cori, Clang, and Cray compiler, we got a speed up now on the GPU of 1.13 of 1.35. So again, we should expect to get a performance improvements also on Perlmutter. Finally, next slides from the same version, why not generating an open ACC version also protected with atomic update. And here on Cori, the speed up rise up to 1.49, almost 1.5, okay? Uh, what did we find in Permuter uh, the other day? So on Monday, next slide, please. But one, so, if you, we are providing in the in the zip 
a launch script where you can reproduce this benchmarking. So every single version you we have described can be compiled with NVIDIA tool change or with GNU tool change. And the, the script launches, executes, and measures the performance. So this is the summary table where we can see that all the initial transformations with outlining, with gather scatter, with inlining, all of these uh, array of structs incur some additional overhead, kind of one second, so 10%, but not too high, but prepares the code for, to, for a better performance optimization. And the overhead is similar using NVIDIA and GNU. When you go to version uh, four and you apply loop fission, this suddenly in permuter produces an Im already an, 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 an improvement in, in the code. We didn't dig deeper into why this is, but loop fission, remember, is separating parts of the computation that are can be optimized manually or using tools like compilers from that that cannot be optimized like recurrence computations. So probably after loop fission, this opens opportunity and locks optimizations available in the compiler and available in the hardware that could not be applied to the original version, okay? So this clearly shows that the process, the path we, we suggest here can bring benefits even in sequential execution, okay? Now we go to parallelization and offloading. Here you have seen we have found different issues with different compilers. So apart from the need to diagnose if it is a bug in the compiler, if it is a problem on the code side or the interaction be between both of them. We highlight here that with NVIDIA on the CPU side, we achieve 1.8 speed up. In GCC, with GCC 12, we don't get the result, but we tested GCC 7, an old version, and this yield 1.x speed up as well. So clearly there is something here that deserves further attention about the compiler, the compiler version, and the interaction between with the code or with the tools like OD. With OpenMP and Atomic, we didn't succeed to produce results, but as in, usually OpenACC is more mature, we decided to benchmark the OpenACC version. And here, uh, cu curious, curiously, TC compiler yielded 1.23 extra speed up. Well, with NVIDIA, we experienced some runtime error that needs further investigation, okay? So this can happen when you go to GPU because of the differences between the uh, matureness of the support of different compilers, different compiler versions. So somehow we wanted to reflect our experience on Monday uh, on Perlmutter with different tool chains and different versions. Next slide, please. So with this, what we can see is that we can produce faster code. The code is already ported to the GPU. So what's next? Can I further optimize the code running on the GPU to make it run faster than the CPU multi-threaded version? Next slide. Here we show some, several ideas. On the CPU side, you can explore more strategies for parallelization, like explicit privatization. This is something we explored with Lule SMK yesterday. You can also remember that after loop fission, we optimize the second loop after loop fission. But the first loop, that, which is part of the hotspot, remains sequential. So this is essentially a for loop that we are working to detect in Kodi. So this is another way of uh, improving the performance, addressing the second loop of uh, the hotspot. And finally, as you have several loops, you need to minimize the synchronization, the creation, or the destruction of the threads. On the GPU side, please, previous slide. On the GPU side, similar things. Go to uh, optimize the first loop of the loop fission. Also, as now you have two loops optimized, minimize data movement by enclosing data movement using white data region for the two loops. And again, 
this is still the starting point. You can then dig deeper into more uh, hardware uh, specific optimizations that you can do on the code if you need uh, more performance. Okay, so what this demonstrates is that this pathway proposes a systematic way of going from difficult to port or difficult to parallelize original serial version, applying a standard optimizations with some rational of why we should use one or another uh, transformation and guided by the tool of Kodi, we can come up with a baseline version ported to the GPU that works, works correctly, and is at least as fast as the CPU version and the optimized CPU version. So we wanted to conclude this section with two final slides. Slide five, that one. So today and yesterday, we have seen three codes that have sparse reductions. And we have seen that sparse reduction can be parallelized in different ways, using atomic, using explicit privatization on the CPU, there are different ways of implementing them. But what is important to understand is that despite the techniques to optimize the sparse reduction itself are the same, the workload or the context where the sparse reduction appears can be completely different. In ATMAX, we have only 10 repetitions of the sparse reduction with very low computational arithmetic intensity, very few flops executed in each iteration. The opposite side is Lulis MK, millions of iterations, and with very high computational intensity, arithmetic intensity, many, many flops involved in the sparse reduction. And CPIC is something in the middle, somehow, okay? So if we take into account these features of the application, and we, in the next slide, we try to draft, this is some, just an intention to try to explain this and try to come with some conclusion. If we were able to create a performance quadrant for the different patterns, this part reduction pattern would look like this. In one of the axes, we have arithmetic intensity, the cost of its execution of the sparse reduction, so number of flops, low or high. On the other side, we have the nature of the scientific simulations, repetition of simulation steps in the time iteration, time step loop. We have very few iterations or millions of iterations. And if we locate CP, KTMUX, and Lulis in the quadrant, we can see that Lulis is in the quadrant high, high. And this is why when we optimize the sparse reduction, we get speed ups on the GPU above 5x. With the same techniques, with CP, we get 1.2x. With the same techniques with ATMUX, we get a slowdown because ATMUX, in addition of all of this, also the computation, the number of flops grows with the memory requirements. So if we use larger and larger functions, we have more flops, but in contrast, we have more memory pressure. So more memory data to transfer from the CPU to the GPU and back from the GPU to the CPU. Okay, so this, is just the intention of this is just try to give some final rational about how we can use the patterns related to motifs in a sparse linear algebra in an structured grids, in a structured grids, and try to see if somehow we can find some relation between the workloads, the motifs, and what we can expect uh, out of performance or the difficulty to get more or less performance on the GPU, depending on the features of the application. Okay, and that's it. This is essentially what we had prepared for today for CPIC. So we have taken almost one hour and 20 minutes. So I think it's a good moment for, for Q&A about the first part and also about the this second part of the, of the, contents. So no questions on the GDOC, but I can see Dimitri from Ulrich, rising hand. Dimitri? 
Uh, yes, hello, very nice presentation. Um, could you please go to the page uh, 28 of your presentation? Yes, that is, I have a question, maybe a basic question concerning the structure of arrays. Uh, so, I mean, um, in the first version, you have a structure XYZ of integer. And um, I, I think that should have a better locality than the second variant, at least from the cache point of view. Uh, don't you think so? Because you basically X, Y, Z, they are located one after another in memory and structures, as far as I understand, they should be located also one after another. So in, in memory, you have X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, versus second variant where if, if array is large, 1000, you have all the time cache misses. You load one array and then you reload second array and first array should go out from the cache. Isn't that right or not? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think what you're saying is uh, completely, completely makes sense. Just uh, make clear that the intention of, this is an example taken from the open catalog. So mm -hmm. the intention of that is try to put very simple examples that okay. someone expert or, or someone new to the field can understand the type of transformation that is suggested. Now, having said that, what you are saying makes complete sense. In order for suggesting a changing array of structs into structs of arrays or separate arrays, it is clear that you can not only understand the structure definition, how the struct fields are used and how many, but also uh, you need to understand the actual uh, size in memory of the data mm -hmm. used or the data of its uh, um, component of the struct and relate this to, for instance, what you say, the cache size. Yes. So mm -hmm. makes complete sense. What uh, to to understand where Kodi is today, and the intention of the catalog is illustrate this. Where Kodi is today, what we are doing is improving the precision of the triggers of all of our recommendations, trying to reason today in terms of properties of the code. So for instance, one typical uh, rational that experts use is if I have a struct of 50 components and I only use two, then in general, this will exhibit poor locality because the cache will try to load what, what, what additional data or fields fit into the cache line, try to bring it and this is wasted uh, mm -hmm. um, locations. So we are trying to implement the triggers based on reasoning in terms of uh, counting number of fields, counting um, the, the usages on the, and the repetition of the usages. It is different that I only use the coordinate X once, or I have 100 references to coordinate X within the loop. So these are features of the software. But also, okay. we will need to you to add in the future features of the hardware. The basic feature is how many bytes does the integer, the float, or double consume. And then finally, try to relate this to a specific parameters of the hardware where you're going to execute. So somehow, the model will be, is expected to be increasingly complex. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so uh, sense, yeah, so I, I, I think yes. So uh, that is a great tool, yes. Uh, but actually, especially if you erase size coming from some input file, you need probably to to make some runs, right, to understand if optimization will work or not. Uh, in general, um, in terms of performance, you always need to run the code and benchmark it. That is mm -hmm. true. But uh, what we learn from decades working with experts from CPU optimizations to GPU optimizations is that at least initially, what the experts are trying to look like, to look for in the code is 
features in the code opportunities that are that definitely makes sense to explore deeper. So, and they reason in terms of this, how many fields, how many usage of a specific field in a particular code snippet that is my hotspot. So in real applications, if you have 500 loops and a tool mm -hmm. can automatically pinpoint, okay, the rational in terms of only the code makes sense in three out of 500. Now, you know that for these three, you will need to do some additional uh, verification. In the end, you can verify it quickly, making the changes and running. Or you can go and try to re reason about the cache size, the memory size, and make the maths or make the, the numbers, right? Mm -hmm. But at least pinpointing the opportunities in large applications can save a dramatic amount of time. Oh, yes, sure. Yes. Yeah. But you're definitely right. This is this is this is true. Okay, thank you very much. And this is let me take this as an opportunity, the reason why in our survey, which we encourage you to all of you to to fill in, we are somehow asking or finding people that might be interested in cooperating or collaborating openly with us to try to make all of these reasonings to give us the insights or motivation use cases that we can use as examples to refine and make more and more precise triggers or create new recommendations that are, we are really missing the catalog today, but that we have the expertise and the technology to automate. So finding real use cases that can motivate this is really important because that way you, you have a direct impact on the science or on the productivity of the community. So we encourage all of you to really at least subscribe or give our contact if you want to collaborate with us. Any other questions? Thank you for staying until this moment because this part of the lab, we believe jointly with Helen and the next team that is really, really interesting, but we know it's not so hands-on, so um, actionable on your side. It's more trying to give you an overview of a pathway that you try to give some, the intention to give some systematic, if possible, way of approaching GPU, porting codes to GPU. Yes, Dimitri? I, I have another small question. Uh, I'm wondering if your tool can also analyze uh, C++ STL code. Definitely a very good question. Um, our our aim is to support C, C++, and Fortran. Uh, unfortunately, C++ STL requires a very significant development effort. So we need it in December, January to prioritize where do we put the effort today, in C++ STL or in Fortran. So Fortran has been uh, a request and, and a missing feature to serve the HPC community for a couple of years now. So we have decided during 2023, during this year, to put all that effort in, in Fortran. And this is where we are. Once we finish and have the, the support for the basic, the features that we know we need to implement in Fortran, probably towards the end of the year, then we can start to consider uh, supporting C++ STL. And we will probably begin with STL vector class because it, it is extensively used out there. Mm -hmm. So this is more or less the roadmap that we have for this year. Okay, thanks. Great. Do you work on C++ only or do you also work in C or Fortran codes? I am working mostly with C and C++ STL, yes. Okay. So our support for C code is, we believe, very mature. And we're going to implement support in the upcoming months, two months, for more sophisticated uses of pointers and structs and pointer arithmetic to try to discover more patterns and trigger more recommendations for C code. So as long as you have C, C++ project and you have snippets of the code that use C-like syntax, you can definitely use Kodi as you see today. Mm -hmm. There is no limitation in that. So I encourage you to give it a try. If that is the 
the, the shape of your project.